good. Amen. And I know Pastor Jerry is here to give us a word, a prophetic word, a word for this time and this season. Amen. So put your hand together. Let's welcome Pastor Jerry David. Thank you, everybody. What a pleasure it is to be with you. And he's right. It's been a while. I don't even know there's been a lot of water under the bridge. My goodness sakes, who would have guessed that the last time I was here, which I really don't remember when specifically that was, but that we would have gone through what we've gone through these last many uh, months. And, and uh, boy, but we're getting back out a little bit. Hopefully you are too. And uh, you know, it's a funny thing. And by the way, can I just tell you before I get going here, I think you've got some of the best pastors in the entire universe leading you. I mean, uh, Pastor Daniel and Connie, oh my gosh, I've known them forever. Seems like it hasn't been that long, uh, but um, wonderful people, high integrity, uh, just a heart of pure gold when it comes to loving the Lord and, and leading a congregation. So you're not only fortunate to be here, because that sounds like luck, and it isn't, but I am so glad God arranged for you to be here. And you need to thank the Lord every day for him bringing you here and putting you under this leadership. Great people. Um, yeah. Don't you know maybe a little bit that it, life is a battle for sure? Come on, amen. But in addition to life being a battle, what's sort of surprising is I think sometimes Christians forget I don't know why they do this, but it seems like Christians forget that um, not only is life a battle, the faith is a battle. Faith is, come on, amen. I mean, we're in, we're, the battle doesn't end until you die and go to heaven. And, and by the way, let me just uh, deal with one little fantasy uh, right off the bat, um, which I think sometimes we get in our minds. <laughs> How many know, and I, I'm, this will be the only depressing thing I say for the rest of the morning, all right? But how many know we all are going to die one day? Yeah. Oh, okay, uh, so uh, stop looking at other things to, listen, God knows the moment he's appointed for you or I to die. Come on, amen? Now, we don't like to talk about that and all that kind of stuff, but you got to live life until he takes you home. And so I encourage you, and by the way, not just live it, not just skate through it, but fight the fight. And so this morning, I sort of want to, with you this morning, I want to take you um, into a passage of scripture, <coughs> excuse me, and what I want to do is encourage you in the Lord to fight the fight, to fight the fight of faith, all right? And by the way, and I'm not going to speak on this this morning, but you've also got to not only fight the fight, you've got to fight the fight in the right battle with the right leader. And if you don't believe that, you go back into um, like a, a First Chronicles 11, I think it is, where you see the story of Saul and his son Jonathan. Jonathan is the best friend of David. Jonathan knows David's going to be the next king. Jonathan says it out of his own mouth. And what happens in First Chronicles, I think it's 11, what happens? Here he is in a battle with his father, who's rebellious against God, fighting a battle he should have never been in. Come on, amen. Under the wrong leader, even family, the wrong leader at the wrong time in the wrong fight. And it ended up Jonathan dying in that battle. Well, look at I don't want to die in the wrong battle. Come on, amen? I, I don't want to die in the wrong battle or fighting the wrong war. So I have to, as a believer, really get my mind on what is God doing right now, and that's the fight I want to be in. All right? Come on. We wrestle not against, oh yeah, some of you know it, uh -huh, flesh and blood, but against powers, principalities, and whoa, 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 watch this one, spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, if you're like me, I'm sort of a Nebraska boy. We're taught sort of how to fight. And oh, I wish I could just really fight. 
You know what I'm saying. Now, this is going to offend a few of you. Don't get up and walk out. It'll get better. But you almost like to take your weapon and fight. But that's not how we fight. We fight in prayer. We fight on our knees. We fight by the Holy Spirit. And that is actually, if we'll get this, it's a more powerful weapon than anything else. But we got to fight. And here's been my problem a little bit, and I hate to say it this way to y'all, but I've been very disappointed, not here or anything like that, but in many Christians that I have met that have checked out of the fight. Now, battles come and go. They ebb and flow. Uh, You're always in a battle, but the intensity comes and goes. You know, it has a season. In the last year and a half, two years, it's been a battle. We understand that. So we're in a battle. But oh my goodness, how many have checked out of the battle is just really sad in my mind. In fact, look around. I think there may even be some that have checked out of the battle that used to come here. Now, I'm not condemning them, but I tell you, you can't check out of the fight. You've got to fight till the very end. Paul's fighting, you will read it in his epistles, he's fighting until the very end where they lop off his head. I'm not, I'm going out in a big way. Come on, amen? So keep fighting. Now, I want you this morning to, that's sort of the extra, all right? I want you, because he gave it to me sooner than he said he was going to, Pastor Daniel did, so I've still got more time. Turn with me to chapter 30 of Deuteronomy. Get your Bibles out, get your iPhones out, whatever you've got, and look at Deuteronomy chapter 30. And this is a lesson here of life that I believe God wants to really deposit in us this morning. And uh, I I believe you're going to get something out of it. I I really, really, really do. And so I... um, I pray that this word really just speaks to you today. And once you found it, I'm going to ask that you, I think they're going to put, oh, they got it up here, all right. I want to do something a little different, just sort of rearrange yourself. Why don't you stand in honor of the reading of the word this morning, and let's read this to to get, I'll read it out loud, but you follow along. And I'm starting in verse 15 of the New King James Version. And by the way, Just at the beginning, let me encourage you when you get back home today, read chapters 27 through 30 to get the full context of what's going on here. Listen to what he says. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil, in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and statutes, excuse me, and his judgments that you may live and multiply. And the Lord God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today, you will surely perish. Whoa, my. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. Come on, amen. That both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, to give them. Now, now, right there, look at verse 19 just one more time. And he says this, I call heaven and earth as a witness today. This is God talking against you that I have set before you life, death, blessing, cursing. Therefore, choose life. Now, before you're seated, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, go ahead. The choice is all yours. There you go. You may be seated. You may be seated. (laughs) 
The choice is all yours. I haven't really looked in Deuteronomy for a long, long, long time. The actual meaning of the word uh, Deuteronomy in the Hebrew, the word dut is actually the word words, words, to speak words. And that's a real appropriate title because that's all that whole book is, the words of Moses. And you need to understand, I'm going to set up a little context for you here, of what was spoken throughout Deuteronomy and understand it then with the context of what we just read. Here, the children of Israel are in the plains of Moab. Make sure you make note of that because there'll be a quiz later on, all right? Moab. They're in the plains of Moab, and they're on the outskirts of the promised land that God has promised them. And our good Bible readers in the room this morning will recall that based upon what happens in Numbers 20, Moses was forbidden to cross over into the promised land with the rest of Israel. He won't, that won't be his assignment. That's the assignment of, that's going to be fall Joshua, his successor. And so what the book of Deuteronomy words are is literally Moses standing before the children of Israel, really at the last moments of his life, to address them for a final time before he dies. And they, and they go on then into the promised land. And they're in the plains of Moab, on the brink of a new season, and Moses, who has led them all the way from Egypt, now stands to give them his last words as they get ready to move into the uh, place that God has for them. In fact, we heard in prophecy this morning, which, uh, there's a new reset, there's a new season coming, and we believe that. When you read through the book, and I pray that you do, actually take Deuteronomy and read through it to check out the facts of this preacher you will find that Moses does three things. In chapters one through four, he recalls their history with God. He opens up by reminding them of their journey from Egypt into the wilderness to now where they stand in the plains of? Oh, good. That's the quiz. From chapters four to 26, he begins then to remind them of the laws of God. Not just the history, but now the laws of God. After recalling their journey with God through the wilderness, he reminds them of the laws of God. Then when you turn the corner to chapter 27 through 30, Moses now begins to recite the new conditions of a covenant with God. Don't, don't miss this. In chapter 1 through 4, he reminds them of their history. In chapters 5 through 26, he recites for them again the laws of God. And in chapters 27 through 30, he now reminds them of what the new covenant with God will demand of each one of them. It's a fight. And when you read 27 through 30, you will find that Moses is really here trying to prepare them for what God really wants to do. They don't know what's around. By the way, you don't know what's around the corner. Come on, amen. You were here maybe back in February or March of 2020. Last year, 2020? Yeah, 2020. You didn't know what was coming. But God prepares. And when you get to that 29th chapter of Deuteronomy, this is what Moses says. You don't need to turn to it. He says, listen, uh, he says, listen you all. The Lord wants to multiply you. The Lord wants to do great things in your sight. It's a prophecy. The Lord wants to prosper you. The Lord wants you to grow. The Lord wants his favor to shine upon you as a nation. God wants to do great things with you as you move into the promised land. He's saying that in chapter 29. But that's not the only option that lies in your future. Now hear this on the plains of... There you go. When they're on the brink of the promised land, Brother Moses steps up, and this is from the Jerry W. David translation, and he says it this way, y'all, this can go down one of two ways, blessing or curse. Come on, I'm from Florida, I can talk that way, all right? <laughs> Life or death. Good or evil? That's it. Two ways. That's it. That's it. Don't just take for granted yeah. 
that because God brought you this far, that God is going to automatically pour out blessing upon you. Just because you got through the COVID, don't assume anything. Come on, amen. There are two roads, he says, in front of you. That's what he says in verse, uh, verse 19. And here's what I love. Oh, my goodness. The choice is all yours. Oh, oh, you can't miss this. God wants blessing for you, but the choice is yours. God wants to give you a good life, but the choice is all yours. God wants you to walk in the fulfillment of all that he has ever promised you or promised this church or promised the elders or I don't care how you slice it. But if you don't get there, get this, you only have yourself to blame. Don't you go blaming God. The choice was yours. The choice is all yours. Can, can I just tell you, Every day, you wake up, you wake up on the plains of Moab. You wake up with the possibilities of what God has in store for you today. What he wants to do in an exceedingly, abundantly, all that you can ask or think of way, and what you prayed for him to do last night. Every morning you wake up, you wake up to new possibilities of God's grace and glory being manifested in your life. Every morning God puts breath in your body and opens up the, uh, the crust from your eyes. God has given you the opportunity to walk in newness of life and embrace the goodness of his grace and glory. But tomorrow morning can go down a different way. There doesn't have to be blessing. It can be stress. Doesn't have to be joy. It can be misery. Doesn't have to be peace. It can be worry. And every morning before you get up out of the side of whatever side you sleep on in your bed, Moses speaks to us and says, the choice is all yours. God has set some blessings for you. Hear me. God wants to answer your prayer. God wants to move in your life. God wants to handle your issues. But if you would walk in the fullness of what God has designed and desired for you, baby, you're going to have to make some choices. I don't know who I came up here to preach this for and up here to freeze myself to death. I looked on my weather app this morning just before I came to church. It's 81 degrees down where I live. But I, I need to tell you, listen, if you pick up this 30th chapter and read what God said to the children of Israel through Moses, you will find at least three critical choices you have to make before your feet hit the floor every single morning. You've got three choices critical to make before ivory soap hits your body in the shower in the morning. You've got three critical choices before crest finds its way into your mouth. Come on, amen. You've got three critical choices to make before you journey off into your day that will determine whether that day is going to be a day of blessing or curse, good or evil, life or death. What choices do I have to make, Pastor Jerry? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here's what Brother Moses told the Israelites, and he passes it on to you and me, if you're taking notes. Number one, you've got to make a choice to be committed to the commandments of God. Oh, man, oh, man. It's going to get a little serious, but we're going to get happy here in a second, I promise you. Listen, when Paul writes by the anointing of the Holy Spirit and says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as, this is as the habit of some, 
that's not God doing that. That's your choice. Come on. Every morning when you, got, when you wake up, you have to make up in your mind that I'm going to be committed to what God has commanded. If you read from chapters 27 through 30, here's what you're going to find out that'll blow your mind. Listen, more than 20 times in chapter, in three chapters, three, Moses commands and encourages and warns the children of Israel to stay committed to the ways of God. More than 20 times in three, diff- three chapters, Moses says, obey God's commandments, his statutes, his judgment, and his law. Repeatedly, Moses says, whatever you do, walk in the ways of God. Don't wander to the left or to the right, but write the word of God on your heart and obey the voice of God. Oh, my Lord. Well, why are you preaching that? Because I find Christians that are obeying every other voice but the voice of God. Come on, amen. It's whatever CNN tells us today, or Fox, I can name any of them. We're obeying things. Obey the voice of God. Come on, amen. Well, what should I do about this, that, and the other? Pray and obey. That's it. Don't let me tell you what to do. Oh, pray and obey. It's the simplest thing, but why do we get that so confused? Why do I? If you would walk in life and walk in blessing and walk in good, then you've got to make a decision before your feet hit the ground that whatever comes my way today, oh God, I am committed to the commandments of God. I am committed to the word of God. I am committed to the voice of God. What he says to me, I will just in raw commitment obey his word. And and this is what Moses says. If you all are taking notes, he says, if you do this, you can't go wrong. If you obey him, you will reap blessings and joy in your life. If you do what the Lord tells you, you will experience the fullness of God's grace and God's glory over your life. Let me tell you why this is so real. Because every morning when I wake up, I'm challenged with a choice of how I'm going to handle the issues of life that are coming my way. Come on, how many know we've had a lot of issues come along in the last 18 months? And man, we're floating all over the place. Just get an understanding of what God wants for your life and then walk in it. Come on, amen. And by the way, what he wants for your life, and this is a little add-on, and you can appreciate me later if you want. Shake my hand and say, oh, that I needed that. (laughs) Don't let what God says to you dictate what you say to other people. Oh, Lord, have mercy. You do you, and I'll do me, according to the word of God. Because I know his voice. I'm not sure you do. (laughs) Come on, amen. You know what I'm saying. I got to hear for me. Aren't you glad there's no priest you have to go to any longer? He is your high priest. Go in and talk to him. Oh, Lord. When I project my daily agenda, what it's going to be, I got to make a decision in the morning of whether or not I'm going to handle this thing my way or be committed to how God says it ought to go down for Jerry W. David. Come on, amen. It's not an easy choice. It's not an instinctive choice. And sometimes, hate to admit, I want to handle it my way. But the choice is all mine. To wake up with a desire to say, oh God, whatever you say today, I've got to do today, and I'm going to be committed to your commandments all single day for every issue comes my way. Can, can I just be a pastor to you for a moment? That's why you ought to read your Bible every day. Come on. So you know what the commandments of God are. That's why you ought to read your Bible, so you know what the Lord requires of you. That's why you ought to read your Bible, so your life can be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Do not tithe because I told you to tithe. Let God reveal it to you. And all you need to do, dear one, is obey the voice of God. 
If he says, if he tells you do not tithe, which he won't contradict his word, then don't tithe. Blessing or curse? It's your choice. Come on, I'm trying to make this so simple, all right? And I'm confusing me. (laughs) Come on. That's why you ought to read the Bible, that you might be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's why you ought to read the Bible, so you can walk in the ways and in the will of God for your life. And here's the truth of the matter. God says it doesn't matter how much you want to be right. It doesn't matter how much you want to be right. If you don't know his word, you can't get it right. Can I say that again so you'll tweet it out correctly? It doesn't matter how much you want to be right. If you don't know his word, you're never going to get it right. I'll give you, uh, let me give you some uh, side order of scripture here. Romans chapter 10. My brother, and Paul writes, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that it may be saved. I bear witness that I have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, they have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. Did I go too fast for you? Let me break that down for you and make it real simple. Passion can never make up for ignorance. Come on, amen. That's no matter how much you want to walk in righteousness. I, I, if I made a show of hands, how many want to serve God and walk in righteousness? Oh, hallelujah, amen, praise God. If you are ignorant of the ways of God and the word of God, your desires can never make up for your ignorance of God's way. It just doesn't work that way. You've got to stay in the word of God and embed it in your heart and tattoo it in your mind and commit it to your memory so that when challenges come like COVID or politics or I don't care what, you remain committed to what God has called you to be. Moses said, listen, y'all, whatever you do, number one, be committed. And here's the tripped out part. He promises them that it will work, but he never promised them it would be easy. (laughs) As a matter of fact, they're in the plains of, yeah, about to go into the promised land. And if you keep reading in Deuteronomy, you're going to find yourself in Joshua. And Joshua is nothing but a record of some battles that went down and they were some big, big, big battles. You think we've been in a battle. Read Joshua. So here is Mo in the plains of Moab saying to Israel, be committed even though some battles are in your future. Until you leave this earth, my dear friends, there's going to be battles. It won't be easy. It won't be convenient It won't pop up overnight. It won't always tickle and feel good. But even when you have the perception of a struggle that you've got to go through, oh, at least be committed to the commandments of God. Can I tell you why you need that? Because sometimes the perception of a struggle causes you to question your commitment to his commandment. Well, here I am living and doing the right thing, and i got to go through this. I've heard Christians say this. Here I am, I've been nice to folks uh, on general Christian principles all my life, and this is what I get? The betrayal? Here, here I am, I, I, oh Lord, I, I've come to church every Sunday trying to do right by God, and this is what I get. And Moses says, listen, I was in church last Sunday, but I just came by to tell you, remain righteous because in due season you will reap if you do not faint. Moses tells them time and again, be committed to God's commandment and you'll find the fullness, fullness rather, of what God has in store for you. And that's not the only decision. That's number one decision you gotta make when you wake up in the morning. That's not the choice, the only choice in front of you. Not only do you have to make a choice to be committed to the commandment of God, but you've got to make a decision and a choice, my brothers and sisters, to embrace the gift of grace. You've got to embrace the gift of grace. That's number two. 
Moses shares with these children of Israel that you all are about to go into a place, and it's a place you didn't earn. And the only reason you're going in is because God promised it to Abraham. It's the only reason. What, what's what he's saying here? The Lord says, you are about to live in houses you didn't build. You're about to reap fruit you didn't work out for. You're about to take over some riches that really don't even have your name on it. That everything that awaits you on the other side of the plains of Moab has got nothing to do with you. It is strictly a gift of grace of God. Can I pause and just shout right there? Thank God for his grace. Because there's somebody that ought to be able to look at you today and give you a little wave, if you would, of an amen to declare you didn't earn it, you didn't merit it, you shouldn't have had it, but God's grace is so good, God's grace is so magnificent that the Lord blessed you with what you could not earn. Don't mind offending your neighbor, for heaven's sakes. And just say, hey, look at me, baby, it's grace. It's just grace. Look at the clothes I ha have on. That's grace. The house, oh wait, if you ever saw the house, God, get bless me, I am a poor little preacher. And I'm living on the beautiful waterway in Florida. Uh, oh my, it's not me. It's God's grace. Look at the strength I've got. It's grace. Look at what I'm doing for a job. It's grace of God. Look at my children. It's grace. He says, everything you're about to have is grace. Don't get it all twisted around and think you earned it. It was grace. And Moses says, if you want to have all of that, then you got to learn to embrace the gift of grace. And you might be thinking... That when I tell you the choice is all yours about choosing grace, you're saying to yourself, well, <laughs> that's easy sounding to me. I mean, Dr. Jerry, you don't have to have a PhD in nothing to know choose grace. <laughs> well, let me tell you why that's so important that you've got to make the choice. Because I told you how Moses started this sermon. You might not have been paying attention. I told you in chapters one through four, he reminded them of their journey with God. And if you read the unedited, unsanitized version, Moses says to them, hey, let me remind you, foolish Israelites, you were all some of the most horrible folk and rebellious folk I have ever met in my entire life. You look up the word disobedient and your mama and daddy's picture is right next to it in Wikipedia. <laughs> you were some of the stiffed, most stiff-necked folk that I have ever dealt with all of my days. Everything God was good toward you, you rebelled. Every time God blessed you, you complained. Every time the Lord wanted to lead you forward, you wanted to go back in the opposite direction. And Moses reminds them how messed up they were, how jacked up in their thinking they were, and how many faults they had, how many mistakes they made, and yet, here you are, folks, in the plains of Moab with grace right in front of you. You messed up royally. You dropped the ball every chance you got. You know good and well you ain't got no business standing here in the plains of Moab, but by the grace of God, here you are with all that God has in store for you. You better make the right choice. Boom. And the reason he tells them to choose is that whenever God presents the gift of grace, there's an enemy that tries to remind you of guilt. That whenever the Lord presents the gift of grace, how many know the enemy, the devil, always has somebody with the gift of memory <laughs> to remind you of why you're not worthy and how you ought to feel guilty. I know that to be true because most of the people I deal with are so incarcerated by guilt, they can't wrap their arms too many times around the grace. They look at what the Lord has promised, what the Lord is providing, what the Lord says you ought to have, and yet they remember every time they failed. 
every mistake they made, and they are incarcerated in guilt. And the Lord says, listen, there is a battle, here's the fight, in your life between guilt and grace, and you have the choice is yours. You've got to make up your mind which one is going to govern your day today. The choice is all yours. Either the guilt of yesterday or the grace that God has for you today. But you've got to make a choice. Either I'm going to walk in my guilt or I'm going to embrace the gift of grace that God has given me for a new possibility. Come on, amen. And the opportunity of today that, by the way, I did not earn for myself. You've got to hold on to that in your spirit so that the next time somebody tries to guilt you, you can just remind them you're operating in grace. And God's grace has given you a new chance and a new possibility and a new opportunity. Yes, God knows my guilt. Yes, God knows I messed up. Come on. Yes, the Lord knows I'm not, I'm not what I should be, but he <laughs> has still graced me. Wish I had some Bible readers in here this morning, but let me give you something you should know. Romans 5.20, the law entered that sin might abound, but where sin abounds, grace abounds so much more. There's always more grace, dear one, than there is sin. And let me tell you how gracious God is, because you're going to read Deuteronomy when you get home, and in the 30th chapter, you're going to find out that this preacher just told you something you're going to read in chapter 30. God starts it out by saying, <laughs> I love God's humor. He starts the whole thing out by saying, I know you're going to mess up. <laughs> I know you won't always be committed to my commandments. I know you won't always do what I told you to do. I know that your life is going to fall short. And here's what he says. But if you return to me, if you come back to where you ought to be, the choice is yours. If you get your act together, the choice is yours. If you ask for forgiveness, the choice is yours. The Lord says, I will still bring you into the promised land. I know you're guilty. I know you ain't got no business crossing into the land. I know you messed up. But if you come back, if you repent, if you ask for forgiveness, the choice is yours. I will still take you into the land. In our country, the hinge pin of our legal system is the Miranda Rights I know there's some of you maybe know exactly what I'm talking about, but we'll not go down that road. When you're obviously uh, arrested, you're gr obligated to tell the officers, obligated to tell you, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney that's right if you can't afford one, and one will provide it for you. Do you understand your rights, madam or sir? It's not like I said, some of you may have heard that before. That's the Miranda that they give you when you're caught and arrested. So I came up here from Florida today to tell you, you have spiritual rights just as well. And when you fall short and when your stuff goes public and when everybody knows what you've done, you have the right to repent. You have the right to be forgiven. You have the right to intercede with the blood of Jesus Christ over your life. You have the right for a new day. You have the right for another chance. You have the right to get your life back right with God. So the next time when one of those sanctified judges try to take you down memory lane, you look at them eyeball to eyeball and say, baby, I know my rights. I know my rights. I got the right for God to turn my life around. I got the right to fall on my knees and confess my sins to the Lord and be forgiven. I know my rights. So the choice is all yours. Here's number one, to be, uh, uh, to be committed to the commandments of God. Number two, the choice is all yours to embrace the gifts of God. But thirdly, and be certain that whatever choice you make, that you make the choice to surrender to the sovereignty of God of God. Commit to his commandments, embrace the gift of grace, and surrender, there's number three, to the sovereignty of God. And you will also find when you get home and read Deuteronomy, as I know you're going to, 
because you are so obedient, that there is one commandment that keeps popping up time after time, page after page, all the way through Deuteronomy. One commandment above all the others that keeps showing up, and it goes something like this. Don't you worship any other gods. Whatever you all do, God says, don't worship idol gods. And repeatedly I found, the Lord says, don't worship idol gods. Now, now here's the funny part about all of this. The one thing that these folks seem to be good at is worshiping idol gods. And the question you've got to ask is, why is God so adamant about us not worshiping idol gods? Why is God so bent out of shape about them worshiping idol gods? And the answer is this. It's simple. When you bow to an idol, you are surrendering control of your life. Listen now. Surrendering control of your life over to something that doesn't have any power. You are bowing to something that is a knockoff, God says, to who I am. You're surrendering, surrendering your destiny to a perpetrator and a fraud. I'm the God that heard you in Egypt, says God. I'm the God that parted the Red Sea. I'm the God that led you through the wilderness. I'm the God, I would remind you, that brought manna out from heaven. I'm the God that brought water out of the rock. I'm the God that took care of your enemies that tried to destroy you. I'm the God, he says, that led you all this way. And how dare you now reach a place where you surrender control of your life to something that has never done a thing thing for you. Something that has never answered your prayers. Something that's never made a way out of no way for you. Something that's never ever stood by your side. Do you understand there is a vast difference between something that looks like it has control and the true and living God who is always in control. And whatever you do, dear one, when you wake up in the morning, tomorrow morning on Monday, make a decision that God is in control of my life. Make that choice. Today, God is in control of my life. Come on. Why is that so important? Because every morning when you wake up, life presents you with uncertainties. Life presents you with issues. And you don't know how they're going to resolve themselves. Every morning when you wake up, I can promise you that the list of those who don't like you or anything about you was added by at least one more person overnight. Come on, amen? Every day, life presents you with threats that are viable against your health and well-being. Every day, life gives you a reason to be afraid of what may be waiting right around the corner outside of your door. And the Lord says, before you leave the plains of Moab tomorrow morning and you walk into the destiny of what I have for you tomorrow and have provided for you by my grace you got to make a decision that no matter what goes down, you will not recognize the authority of anything or anyone over your life other than the true and living God who answered your prayers, who woke you up tomorrow morning, who blessed your life, who saved your soul. He's the only one. I don't know who I came up here from Florida to tell but you got to learn about some false gods. Yes. Come on, amen? Yes. Your sickness is a false god. Don't bow. Oh, here's another. COVID is a false god. Is it real? Oh, yeah. 
But I can tell you right now, even as real as COVID is, our response to it worldwide, I might add, Christian or non-Christian, is demonic. It's a false god. I had COVID, but I didn't bow. Come on, amen? Your financial troubles, that's a false god. Folks that hate you, that's a false god. Oh, here's a biggie. And listen, I'm going in a few minutes anyhow, so it doesn't matter. I've got a plane. (laughs) Republican or Democratic political parties. False God. Jesus, help us. (laughs) Cancer. False God. News medias. False gods. Presidents named Donald or Joe. False gods. Come on, amen. Everybody gets it in this room. Come on, amen. <laughs> We're not of this kingdom. We're of a totally different kingdom. Now, you go vote. You got your favorite. I get all of that. Oh, that doesn't bother me. But, oh, my God, when I see Christians bowing, I'm going, what in the world is going on here? Choose life. Choose blessing. Come on, amen. Oh, Lord, help us. You better wake up in the morning with this decree in your mouth that the Lord God is the only control over my destiny and my life. I recognize no authority ultimately but God's. Hey, my son works for United. He's up as an executive with United Airlines. They made everybody get the shot and all this. God is still God. Come on, amen? That, that employer is not his God. That's just a means to an end. And he's winning people to the Lord all over the place. Where are you going? Come on, amen? Get some discernment about you. He's got control over your life. I heard somebody the other day say, well... If you get the shot, now, uh, if you got the shot, that's fine. I'm, I'm talking about the news media. I'm not, I'm not giving you this back and You won't, if you do die, you won't die as bad. <laughs> now, I'm not a doctor in the medical field, but my mama ro- raised me up with some common sense. When you die, it's bad. <laughs> Come on, Amen. Come on, but if you know Jesus, you're going to him. And that's why I started this message out 40 minutes ago by telling you he's got my life in his hands. Listen, if I die of COVID or the common cold, would you please have a moment of silence for me next Sunday and say, you know what? It was God's time for him to go. Come on, amen. And rejoice in that. I'm looking down at you going, hey, have fun. Have fun. The choice is all yours. <laughs> Come on. Who is the king of glory, the psalmist says? Not my enemies, not my sickness, not my trouble, but the Lord who is strong and mighty, the Lord who is mighty in battle. I declare to you today, no one needs to sit on the throne of your life but God. I will tell you this, when you know God is in control and, the only, and you only recognize the sovereignty of God in your life, it, it will put some courage in your spirit. You don't have to be afraid of what folk will do. You don't have to be afraid of how things look like right now because you know there is a God who is watching over me. Come on, a God who answers my prayer, a God who makes a way when there are no ways. Old song, this is old, old school. Be not dismayed, the the, the, uh, hymn said, whatever be tied, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. So you got to make some choices. Every morning when you wake up, make a choice to be committed to the commandments of God. 
Every morning when you wake up, make a choice to embrace the grace of God in your life. Every morning when you wake up, make a decision in your mind that you are going to declare that ultimately God is the only sovereign God over your life. There's nobody else. Don't render, please, don't render the authority over your life to anything or anyone other than God. Choose it. Blessing or cursing. Life or death. Choose life. Come on, amen. How many received this this morning? Amen. Amen. Listen, please, please, whatever you do, don't make your choice somebody else's choice. Don't look down on somebody else because of the choice they've made or had to make or want to make. God is leading them And God's going to lead you if you allow him to. Come on, can I get an amen? Amen. My biggest concern has been to see the division that's come into the house of the Lord over this dumb thing. That's why I know it's it's demonic. Boy, oh boy, God is sovereign. Come on, amen. He's got to be that force in our lives. I don't submit to something that I, or give control to something that has no power. He's got all the power. Amen. I want to pray for you this morning. Would you bow your heads? Heavenly Father, we stand right now, every one of us, as it were, in the plains of Moab with new possibilities and promises that are right now before us. Blessings, life, and good But there's also death, evil, and curse. But you've told us in chapter 30 here, the choice is all ours. And we choose today, O God, to be committed to your commandments. We choose today, O God, to embrace your grace. And we choose, O God, today to recognize that you alone are in control. And if someone today chooses in this place to give their life to Jesus Christ, let them right now know and understand that they have made the right choice. And let your Holy Spirit now invade their hearts and minds with your presence so that they too can receive the blessing and the good that you promised all of us in Deuteronomy chapter 30. And I pray right now, Lord Jesus, that every one of us with our own homes, our own families, our own set of circumstances that we're dealing with, that you would give us the courage to walk as you show us without intimidation, without condemnation, but with a courage that speaks to the world. God is in control of my life. I am enjoying the embrace of of his grace upon my life. And to the best of my ability, with the help of the Holy Spirit, I choose to obey and honor every command of God. I thank you for that today, Lord, and I pray that this word right now would be sealed by your spirit into the life, mind, and heart of every hearer. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God.